Ticket Volume brings you a guest who has been consulting since 1995. He's led training organizations in the UK's Mindsweep org. He's had a great stint at G2G3 where we met up, as well as some time at Linium and Cognizant. Now he's an innovation consultant for CDW. Welcome to Ticket Volume, news and information for improving IT experiences. I'm your host, Matt Barron, and this podcast is powered by Invigate, a global leader in IT service and asset management software. As you know, every week, I chat with different IT leaders to share insights on service management, technology, business, and this episode is no exception. But before we start, don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment. Now, let's begin. Welcome to Ticket Volume, Lauren Campbell. Thanks for having me, Matt. Looking forward to this. Yes, excellent. Good to have you on. I love that title, that CD, CDW title. What is an innovation consultant? Well, it, well I'm part of an innovation team inside, uh, inside ServiceNow Solutions with inside CDW. And, and what the title implies is that we, we get involved at the, the senior stakeholder and leadership level to help shape First of all, understand what the problems lie with inside the organizations, and then start to look at, at approaches that can be applied to move them forward. So, so the reason innovation is sometimes, most times we've got a service catalog item that we can use to do it, but sometimes, sometimes we have to innovate. Sometimes we have to look at what's there and what's needed, and it might not sit in our catalog. So we have to be able to adjust in order to help our clients meet their business and operational needs. Okay, interesting. So you're trying to expand people's minds to understand what services or products they need to incorporate in, into their ops to deliver value. Yeah, yeah, and, and actually, so what we find, what we find a lot, and what I found not just where I'm at now, but previous, is is there's different levels of understanding of where of, of where people are in their journey. So the leadership will have a different understanding. Uh, their, their, their management and then their operational teams below that, they'll all have different levels of, of understanding. So one of the things that, that we do is, is to try to find out what they think they need and what they don't know. And, mm -hmm. and don't know may not be just on a specific level. Sometimes it's a collective level. So that's an interesting little conversation to figure out that because no one's going to tell you what they don't know because they don't know it. Um, so we, we, we try a few little approaches to, to, to find where that is because that's key before we start moving towards any solutions uh, and any help. We need to understand where they're at. Man, that sounds so much like therapy, like, like occupational therapy, like business therapy kind of. <laughs> you need to look inward and reflect and you you can't always nail it, but someone with enough experience uh, or who has been studying this kind of thing for long enough might be able to give you some perspective to explore it further. Is that, is that kind of accurate? The therapy is a perfect example of it because, because we're, and anybody, not just where we're at, but across the industry, you have to facilitate that conversation. You don't necessarily, I mean, we know a lot of ideas, but we have to hear a lot of where their perceptions lie. We can't do anything until we get those perceptions right. Um, we start to align with them. And in some cases we have to educate. So so it's, it's we'll go into a conversation, we'll do some fairly high level conversation, uh, it, it discussions, we'll start to get that back and forth going. And then every now and then we'll maybe test their understandings with with known metaphors. And, and that usually opens up a wider conversation. Sometimes when we're talking with leadership teams though, or, or even management teams, they'll, they'll, they'll keep the focus of the conversation fairly tight. And, and the more we can open it up and outside, the, the better we can understand the right path to take them on. Wow, what a great spot to be in and what a great service to provide because, you know, we, we used to say in the early 2000s, we used to say no one ever got fired for bringing in IBM. Right. And so many executives like heard that kind of thing or saw the results of that and they just brought them in willy nilly. Like, of course, I'm going to bring them in. That's that's my role. I have to do this. I have to try this new thing. What you're doing is you're hope, helping helping them understand their context, the bigger picture, and then providing some experience for why that wor would work or why that wouldn't work and, and that sort of perspective. Absolutely. And, and I think, well, well, I know how this 
moves into the more practical realms is is technology is one of those things that it's got it's got edges to it it's got numbers to it it's it's got it's got real tangibility that you can hold on to and and the, the the classic other two circles of the Venn diagram of people and process, they can be a little bit nebulous. So once urgency, business urgency is applied to a situation, it's usually the technology that's focused on the quickest. Um, and, and then at that stage, you start to clear the room of other people and just leave the technologists in the room. There's nothing wrong with that. But if it's not aligned, if it's not guided by process, if it's not aligned with the actual business need, you could be in some form of design jail or or you'll be somewhere where you don't want to be. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> design jail? I've been there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have to explain that concept every now and then. A lot of people inside the near and close to technology will get it, but sometimes their bosses don't get it and they don't understand. And, and they don't understand typically that they might actually be indirectly, the bosses might be indirectly responsible for building that jail in the first place just based on directives mm. that are coming down. Yep, exactly. Yeah, and we see that more and more as technology becomes more complex and dynamic in in the, the age of CI, CD, the age of DevOps. Um, the leaders have a hard time connecting the, the the business outcomes to the individual tools processes that are that are underlying right yeah yeah so that so, so to me that's where it gets right close to the atomic structure of what's going on it's it's connecting the the micro and and that's the operational that's the tactical with the macro all the way through and then so so we we look at desired states of how we want things to be an ideal you look at models uh of operational teams, you'd maybe look at like Formula One pit crews where everybody knows exactly what to do, when to do it, how to do it. They've got measurements, they're trying to shave off microseconds off things. Well, that's a tight little team and you can sort of control that. And well, it actually gets bigger as you move away from it with the financing and the engineering and all that stuff. But but you're looking at other things like, like military units that be the same idea where people, process and technology are very, very tight. So we know what it looks like but I'm fascinated and our team is fascinated. Uh, and, and, and I know I've got a lot of people outside of CDW and yourself included are fascinated as to why those things don't work. And that's the fascinating part is because I think if you understand that why a train jumps off the track, you can usually start to get ahead of it to prevent it from jumping off the track. So, so that piece you're talking about, that main corner and that train track that bumps that train is 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 the lack of effective storytelling i believe mm, interesting yeah so so um w what is what is missing the the leaders aren't telling compelling enough stories or the 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 micro level isn't bubbling up to the leadership level well using an analogy of the, of the russian doll or the stacking doll so you've got the outer doll would be, be the bigger doll that would be the the, the business purpose was lined in. So, so, so what, what we find is, is there's usually an understanding of some form of the supply and demand dynamic that happens inside an organization at that stage, but it starts to break down. There's interpreters, there's, as you come closer towards core process and even the technology right at the center of it, you go through those layers, the, the ability to connect the story to the outer story starts to fall apart. And, and, mm -hmm. and why it's so important is, is we, we, most of us, well, all of us are purpose led. Either we know it or, or we just feels good when we do it right. We don't understand we're purpose led. And, and having that story helps us connect to that purpose all the way through. And if that is broken, that's when you start getting people just following the numbers, calling it in, just showing up for a job and so forth, and maybe not adhere. Even if the process has been created and it doesn't quite make sense, you've got an option of either doing it and commenting it or just skipping it. And most people will just skip it if they're not connected with the, with the purpose. So the story is important. I love it. Of course, I love it because <laughs> this is what this is what I'm all about is that purpose, right? And you see it in my tweets all the time and all of my content. We're, we're in this for the for the long haul, right? 
we're, we're always going to be committed to this industry. We just can't help ourselves. We've seen the trains go off the track so many times that all we can do is watch them and just hope that they stay on. I love that what you're saying about the, 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 those nested dolls or nesting dolls, how you at that micro level, the smallest of the dolls, you can't just have like 20 of those little dolls and make one big doll out of them. You really do need to be connected up to the next level, to the next level, to the next level so that, and, and I do this all the time when people are saying, how do I measure my help desk? How, what metrics matter to me? I constantly go back. What is the vision of your company? What is the mission of your company? What are your department goals? What are your team goals? What are your individual goals? And walking through those steps is really where you start connecting people to the, the reason they joined or the reason their team exists or the reason their organization exists. Yeah, that's, I, you know, and I, just as you're saying that, it just reminds me about how many calls you jump on lately where that is skipped from the start of the call. What's the purpose mm -hmm. of the call? What's the expected outcome of the call? And, and when that doesn't happen, you can see that the, the output of that call may not be as optimized. So taking that from a very simple example to what you just talked about as far as uh, projects, ab absolutely. And then, so then I ask, ask myself, well, like, why, why don't people do that? Like, what are the reasons? And, and we storytelling, yeah, storytelling, absolutely. And, and, and I think also, also maybe there's, there, there's not maybe an appreciation or an empathy that not everybody's on the same page that you're on the same page. So it's always important for just on a day to day activity to make sure that you've got people with you it takes, doesn't take that long to check, but also if you're going into larger programs or projects, you also want to make sure that there's the appropriate communication that is connecting to the audience and then connecting against the purpose all the way through. Yes, yes. And, and trusting the people managers, trusting your teams to, to understand each other, what drives Lauren versus what drives Matt, right? Like it's, it's going to be a completely different thing. Matt, you know, maybe he just likes to help people and Lauren wants to make a ton of cash mm -hmm. or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, knowing what pe what drives people is what gives those people managers that advantage and, and makes your project shine. No, ab ab absolutely. And then I think about I think about other examples. I think when when you've got more time, when you've, you've taken a lot of your reactivity, reactive activity off the table and you're able to look at proactivity, you can start to look at other stuff. And <laughs> and there was a period of time where it was. I had a bit of time I could lift my head up and see, and I, I talked with the VP of HR, and they were talking, he was, he talked about an organization he, he used to uh, run the HR department for, and, and they created uh, medical devices for a specific medical operation, and it was a, it was a critical operation, and, and every year they would have a conference, and they would have three people that stood up on stage from various uh, age groups, if you will, and they were all benefactors of the operation that used their uh, technology. And s those people were up on stage and everybody from that organization, everyone from the accountants to the technologists, to the engineers that were designing it, to the sales reps that were selling it, were all in the room and they could be connected with those people. And so that purpose, is, is I think incredibly strong. I mean, it, there's a lot of process that, that's negating that story, but definitely start with the purpose and then move backwards. Yeah, I, that is such a good story. <laughs> I worked for a medical de device manufacturer and sat in a meeting that was very similar to that. They brought in a couple and the the it saved their lives. Like the this man um, was severely depressed and was actually willing to take his own life trigger warning hmm. but um hmm. and and to have that witness to have that connection to your purpose uh, as a company really made me take the job much more seriously when the sales reps were calling up from the ORs from the operating rooms that like in that moment I know that they're trying to save someone's life and of course I would raise up to the rise up to the challenge. Like I'm going to help you faster. I'm going to make sure you're super connected. Like it just inspired me to, to do better. I think, I think it's, nope. um, we, we, we deal with a variety of different sectors and, um, 
So when we're inside healthcare, uh, there's there's definitely appreciation and understanding that that lives are at stake at the end of the at the end of the process, but not always. I mean, there's still pockets of areas where they're they're heads down, they're focusing on things with with great value, but sometimes it's not fully balanced out to the impact outwards. So, at a high level, um, creating that understanding and empathy is 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 massive. Hmm. Yeah. And I think like, I don't know, someone posted on, on a Slack that I'm a part of uh, recently, the CX Accelerator Slack. If you haven't checked it out, go to CX Accelerator and check it out. Uh, Nate Brown runs a great Slack and um, with his team. And someone posted, I'm in the oil industry. What are some really important KPIs for the oil industry? And it, I think it was hard for this person to come to terms with the fact that sustainability should be one of their KPIs and making money is one of their KPIs. It's kind of interesting to think about that dichotomy. Like, of course, we can take healthcare and be altruistic and say we're saving lives or helping people or keeping people healthy. But sometimes the organization just doesn't adapt to what the market is actually wanting right now. Or you see like oil just went down three and a half percent today yeah. uh, in price. Yeah. And, and why is that? Because we're starting to value um, the uh, lower carbon emission style of transportation. We're starting to value um, uh, self-transportation, self-powered transportation. And the companies need to keep up with what the market needs. And that comes all the way back to business value mapping. You know, it's very similar to value stream mapping, but it's like, where do you fit in the market and what value do you provide to the people yeah and and so when we get so we look at our a uh, lot of the the, the the clients that we engage again some of them do know their issues and some of them don't know their issues mm. um but but ultimately we the framework that's served me fairly well is it's it's all about basic supply or demand and supply so organizations exist to to meet a market need so even if it's a if it's the government or or healthcare or they are still serving a market need all the way through and then inside the organization uh th there's also that he, uh, demand and supply so the people facing the market if they're selling something facing one way if they need a laptop and they turn behind them they then become the demand instead of the supply and then their internal IT is now the supply back and forth and that's all the way through the function so HR uh, CSM customer service management all those different types so everything it's all about that conversation that goes uh, back and forth and and a lot of the organizations that we deal with, sometimes they 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 just they're so busy serving and keeping the fires from spreading all the time that they're they're unable to lift their heads up and see what's mm. going on. Intellectually, they get it. Almost all our customers typically get it, but it's like, okay, what do I need to do to do now? And and again, the very first thing is to is to align leadership in the macro story. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we use, we use simulations for that. Actually, it's quite, it's quite useful. It's very useful. So you are still using simulations. Cause that's kind of, <clears throat> that's one of the ways that I met you was through G2, G3 and using simulations to drive. If in those days, it was really to help people understand <laughs> that they needed a ticketing solution <laughs> <laughs> and a knowledge base. And like, you have to understand the things you're using every day. It was very simple back then, but it sounds like what you're doing now is a bit different, more more executive driven. Yeah. So, so the, I mean, the his, the history of the simulation or or this type of simulation came out of MIT, uh, S -S -S Sloan School of Business, and they they back in the '60s was a, a game called the beer game, and the whole idea was the their MBA uh, students that were going through it were were that sadly there's no beer drinking in this game, but it but it's it's all about uh, process behavior and technology and how to and how they they work together and how they mature together so it's not just a flick the switch you've got a perfectly running machine it's how do you get from from lying flat to crawl to walk to run all the way along lines so so the, the games were, were adopted by um or the, they were inspired sorry by uh, organizations in europe and g223 was one of them and yeah you're right it was originally done to help vendors sell the value of their of their products and services and and at that time, it was more like an epiphany, just to create 
uh, urgency in the sales cycle, if you will. But mm. what we use it now for is 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 more of a that therapist discussion that you were talking about before. It's a way of taking that from the nebulous and putting it into the practical. So we use it all the time when we'll put um, uh, disparate groups of people inside a room with various levels of understanding of of service management, be it IT or HR, it doesn't really matter because they're, they're all the exact same dyna dynamics. They just have a different language to them, that's all. And what they get to do is they get to experience the practicalities of a maturing system. It's all one thing to say, this is our process, but what happens when you really run a lot of traffic through that process? Where does it flip over? Why does it flip over? And if you can see that in a safe zone and you build up the confidence in that safe zone, You've, you, A, you've acquired an experience. It's not a learning thing. You experience it. So you hold it, you own it, you believe in it, you've, you've got trust in it. And you can take that understanding now and apply it to your real world. How powerful. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's such an interesting tool because it allows the lens of macro to focus down into micro very quickly. And then we can move it directly up to macro again. So as yes. soon as people say, well, how did that, what's going on there? We can zoom right down into that, into that active case study that we're actually working on. Look at what's actually going on, pull the strings apart of process, behavior, and technology. See where one of the strings were cut or weren't connected. Look at the impact financially, the impact on process, the impact on experience. Look at that and see how that sits on a, a large scale PNL and then go back and forth as we move through the maturity of it. So yeah, it's, it's I, it, we don't, we always say we don't teach anybody in this because we don't, it, we just guide it. And the way that they've been designed are, are phenomenal and they allow people to discover on their own. Um, we're, we're not there to teach, we're just there to listen. Um, and, and, and every time we do it, I, I learn more every time because I'm seeing a new behavior pattern. And then what's allowed me over the years, I've been delivering these for about 13 years, you can, you can have a few conversations and within the first three or four sentences with an executive, you can start to, you'll hear the top level points and you know the derivatives and how they're, in, how they're entangled below that conversation. You, you've got a fairly good idea. You obviously want to validate it, but you're starting to get it. Mm. So yeah, the experience is, it's fun and it's fun people like fun so yeah yeah exactly i love that safe zone i'm an experiential learner myself so of course i love that stuff we see this in change enablement right now because change managers are just trying to figure out like what do i even do here if i'm not controlling and commanding what what developers can do what infrastructure professionals can do and for so long i've been recommending to change managers go out and develop an app Go out there and just learn yeah. what the developers are doing. What is app dev doing? What is the infrastructure doing? And what you're doing and, and what, what a simulation does is it allows that exploration from a process and leadership perspective, the, the, the adjacent parts of building an app or building a product or service. You can explore those without having to learn Azure, without having to learn Jenkins and GitLab and CI/CD. You can you can do it without that that big learning overhead. No, but to, to the point that you've made of how you what your recommendation for those who do know coding, it's not coding. You're trying to help them understand. They're trying to understand everything right. in and around the outside of that piece, and that's. So that advice you're giving, Matt, is bang on. It's it's if they already have the skills, then lean on that skill and say lean outside that and see what's going on, because then they're going to start to under, understand where it falls down. I think one of the things that we there's a lot of metaphors we use and or and analogies, and there's there's one about the uh, I believe it's an old uh, old Hindu analogy where it's uh, an elephant walks into a village of blind people and they all touch different parts of the elephant. They're holding the tail and one person, the blind person is like, well, this is a rope we're talking and, and touching the leg. It's a tree trunk and so forth. And, and, and all the various disparate parts of an elephant are all reported inaccurately to each other. And they all get in an argument of what it's about. That's service management. It's an elephant that you can only get to touch a certain part of. And if you don't understand what the full elephant looks like, 
you'll never be able to to deal with it and guide it appropriately. And and that's this is one of the ways. It's not the only way. Um, there's there's a bunch of other ways, but this is the one that that we use because it's it's rapid and it's quick. And and it also brings on a, a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and that is um, uh, where well, we talk about purpose. Um, but it's but it's empathy, and and. Mm. And empathy in design, empathy in operation, and I, I think what happens, and well, I know what happens in organizations. We 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 want to scale things, and we want to increase its frequency. We want to measure things. We want to, as soon as it's working well, we want to run it faster. Well, and and that's all great and well. It gives us a good return. But then the danger is, is if we're if we're not careful with the empathy levels of the operators, we could start to burn out that system. And and what that mean? What that does that mean in a practical sense? It means that contact center people they're not really caring when they're answering the phone. Or we've got we've got engineers that are sticking to SLAs versus uh, reports that are coming in on top of the ticket that says, "Look, we need this because of X, Y, and Z." You're getting people starting to call things in. Um, I'm not saying that we have to we give them enough empathy that we overwork them but we it's a balance between that we have to give them that sense and and the one example i think about this is is a uh, uh an auto club and they they ran a, a knock a beautiful knock it's it's very nice network operating center and it's got these great screens up there that shows you all these indicators to to to, to take action on and so forth and when we were understanding what their internal business client was saying was like they're not treating anything with urgency at all. It's just it's uh, it's very stagnant. The service it's 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 good, but it's it's still there's kind of like walking to the fire. Um, mm. So what we what we figured out is there was there was this disconnection between the service and the benefactor of the service. So one of the suggestions we made, which was very low tech but still uh, impactful, is we wired in CCTV from their retail divisions so they could actually see humans standing in line waiting to get service in their in their online uh, sorry in their in-store facilities now yeah didn't necessarily connect somebody who's holding a baby that's been raining outside with the actual service but it, it reconnected the people inside that room with what they're doing and, and why they're doing it and uh it had, it had great effect so little little things like that also work and help in the right right situation yeah, what a great story. Those field visits and understanding and watching users interact with your service and product, invaluable. One of the, I love this example because it's one of the best ways that you can take experience design and extend it into your other departments. Show the developers what it's like to use the application. Show support what it's like to call in to support and, and experience those processes. No, absolutely. And there's there's another thing that I that I think that that helps with with this type of the back into the simulation dialogue. It is very much a dialogue because because it's not just explaining how the art of the possible could be. It's that once the participants see how it could be, how the appropriate processes can be interlinked, how they can be locked down in a technology, and how it's going to actually have a business benefit. But it also gives the participants a chance to reflect and make suggestions about how their organization could benefit. So you're, you're not just telling, you're listening. It's this cycle of, and, and it, we find it being very, very useful. Nothing's worth than just the consultant coming in and just talking to you and just telling you how it's going to be. <laughs> it has to be this, this, this revolving dialogue and it's got to be revolving around something that's that's focused that's going to be driving a, a business and operational result yeah that's great i love that that's such a good point if you really want to test a, a consultant ask them a question they literally cannot answer and see if they give you a lie because that's kind of like if you if you run these simulations you totally understand look this is how it is i have the context i can apply it i just love it um so lauren how can people connect with you and learn more uh, well, I'm uh, I'm at Lorne, L-O-R-N dot Campbell, C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L -L, at C-D-W dot com. And that's where I'm at. That's where you can find Lauren. Well, thank you for joining us on Ticket Volume, Lauren. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for having me. 
And to our audience, thanks for listening to this episode. We've got a bunch more out there and more yet to come. So don't forget to subscribe to receive an alert every time there's a new episode. You can also DM me or email me. If you've got a topic or a guest you want to hear from, nothing is too crazy for ticket volume. So please leave us a review, feedback. You know how the algorithms love interaction. This podcast is brought to you by Invigate, the all-in-one IT service and asset management system that helps organizations with world-class IT support teams. If you're looking for a solution to build your help desk without the headaches of year-long implementations, you will love Invigate. In fact, IT teams from NASA, Toyota, and McDonald's use Invigate to manage requests, automate workflows, and centralize inventory data so they can focus on delivering better service. Thanks for hitting play, and I'll see you around the way. 